ಸದಾಶಿವಸಮಾರಂಭಾಂ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮಾಂ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾಂ ಓ ಸೊ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿಲ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಫ್ರಮ್ ವಿ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಐ ನೋ ಗೋಪಿ ಜಿ ಯುವರ್ ಅವೇ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಕಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆಷನ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ವಿ ಹವ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಡೆಡ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಲೋಲಿ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಮೇನ್ಲಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಕಾಂಟಂಪ್ಲೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಮೀನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೋಸ್ ಟು ಸೋ ಫಾರ್ ಸೊ ಐಲ್ ಶೇರ್ ಮೈ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮೀ ಲೆಟ್ ಮೀ ರೀಡ್ ವಾಟ್ಸ್ ದರ್ ವುಡ್ ಯು ಬಿ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ರೀಡ್ ಆರ್ ವುಡ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಿಫರ್ ಇಫ್ ಐ ರೀಡ್ either way it's okay for me okay could could you read that might be better one minute okay let me know if it's visible are you ha hari om nikita mantan so we are reading from here how to choose a guru okay i i guess i'll i'll read kopi ji since um no the, i'll read could you could you okay is, okay nikita go ahead the print okay. is very small oh yeah i think nikita nikita can read that you can you can mm-hmm. take on next okay. yeah nikita how to choose read. how to choose a guru to choose a guru can to choose a guru can also be a problem do you find a teacher with the longest or the whitest beard so much is said by so many everyone claiming to know the truth given all this confusion first and foremost i would say that the best teacher is one who looks at the whole human problem as an error if someone says Nikita, you have a I'm problem sorry. uh i forgot we did this last time we, we did this uh, this section so uh now well, now we are here actually my memory is even I'm actually terrible at this. Uh, okay. Uh, there we go. We are here. I'm sorry. The Gita is a dialogue, please. Okay. The Gita is a dialogue. The Gita is a, is a dialogue. In fact, all the teaching is in the form of a dialogue. Although the methodology of teaching does not necessitate the presentation of characters and the dialogues between them. After all... we are not interested in knowing the names of the teacher or the thought we are only interested in the teaching itself but then the characters involved in the dialogue are presented in the form of a story an akhyayika mm-hmm. yeah in order to tell us something about ourselves we find the same approach in the upanishads where many names of people are cited if tatvamasi that thought is the message why not just talk about that why not just talk about that message why are all this, these stories brought in only to reveal the method of teaching the sampradaya how we have to learn and what type of knowledge it is now ah, so this is uh, very nice so as as i mentioned a few times uh, puja samaji really brings in the pedagogy which is that it's not just the teaching but the way that you teach that we are also focused on and even if the teaching is correct you know what a teacher knows is correct if the communication has any holes in it uh, the teaching is going to be full of holes okay so um, you know we we've, we've seen this you know whether it's part of satsanga or any other interaction we have usually it it is very beneficial for us to be able to have a dialogue with a guru there will be a pravachan uh, that's delivered uh, this will be in the form of shravanam but the student will always have doubts and these doubts are revealed to the teacher through questions and then the teacher is uh, responding so you you have uh, prashna and you uttara and so these back and forth uh, dialogues uh, you know form the basis of a conversation and these conversations uh, you know pujya samji is going to be speaking about what are the different uh, four different types of dialogues so if somebody would like to volunteer to read next i can continue please yeah the four types of dialogues there are different types of dialogues 
One is a discussion involving two or more people who are interested in finding out the facts about a certain subject matter. They are all exploring. In this type of discussion, there is no teacher-student relationship. Each person is equally placed, even though one person may know a little more than the others about this, the subject matter. They are all interested in understanding this kind of discussion among equals any collective study among students, for example, is called Veda, no? Vada? Vada. Vada. And is naturally healthy and is traditionally an important component of study. It is said that a student gains a quarter of his knowledge by such discussions. There are also two unhealthy types of dialogue that we should be aware of. One is a dialogue that takes place between two people who are already committed to different beliefs. Such a discussion, called Jalpa, is governed, is governed purely by each person's wit. Any discussion between two fanatics falls into this category. Each of them is convinced that the other person is totally wrong and tries to win the other over to his or her particular belief, although there is no basis for the discussion. Suppose you have a belief and I have another belief. Your belief may be right and mine may be wrong. On the other hand, my belief may be right and yours may be wrong. Or both of us may be wrong. Both of us may be right also. How then can either of us insist that I alone am right? The difference between a believer and a fanatic becomes obvious here. So we'll, we'll pause here because there's some good stuff to unfold. Um, by the way, just folks, uh, please come on webcam if you aren't already. It's a requirement. OK, so um, you know, for this somebody talks about four four types of dialogues. They've not all four been explicitly um, unfolded here. Let me see if it's done below. Just want to make sure. Okay, the, it is it is done below. So then I'll not get into it. Um, but but one question before we proceed. Okay, here it says, how can either one of us insist that I alone am right? So let let me ask this question in the context of Vedanta. If someone wants to. Share. We say that Vedanta reveals the self. It reveals the self in the form of words. And anything that is contrary to this teaching is incorrect by, by extrapolation. Because if Vedanta reveals a thing about oneself, it cannot be something else that is spoken of by somebody else. So there is already that exclusion that takes place. So what separates us from fanatics? That could be a doubt that one has. That you know, what if we are being fanatical? What if we are all wrong? Or what if we are all right? Or what if nobody's right? <laughs> Any thoughts? Somebody will have thoughts. There's so many people in this chat, in this discussion. She probably has some thoughts. You have some thoughts? No, OK. Let me. Somebody else then. <laughs> See, remember, it goes back to Pramana. I was just uh, emphasizing this fact that when you talk about Pramana, then it is not a matter of belief anymore. Uh, you can believe somebody if they say that, oh, um, I have a million dollars, somebody says. You can believe that person, or you can disbelieve that person based on the trust that you have in that individual, right? based on the history that you have with that person. If the person is prone to being um, prone to falsehoods, if the person is a perpetual liar, then you are the degree of value that you will place will be very low on what they say. But then if it is somebody that you trust wholeheartedly, somebody that you you've known for a long time, then you are, you, you are likely to assign a greater value to what they say. But over here, this is completely different, because this is not in degrees of trust. That, yeah, you know, I'm 90% I'm, I'm sure what the Vedas say, but you know, there's this 10% of a lingering doubt that I have. It, if that is the case, then the knowledge will not take place. Because for knowledge to take place, one doesn't have to believe, one has to know. 
belief always comes with a fraction of a doubt. That's why you have to believe. You have to take on faith. Right? They say take it on faith. We are not taking it on faith. We are using Shraddha as a starting point, but Shraddha is not faith. Shraddha is trust pending understanding. Okay, and this trust pending understanding, sorry, is <laughs> just show it already. Show it already. She she got this. Uh, my my brother-in-law Manthan, who's on the call, exposed her to Pokemon cartoons, and so now she's obsessed with Charmander. Uh, that's his name. And initially, when I heard the name, Char it's, his name is Charmander, but I heard Charminder and I thought it's some Punjabi female. So anyway, okay, I'm Vika. Mama passage. Daddy, that's encouraged. All right. So um, so when we talk about the Vedas, the Vedas being a pramana are of the same truth value as names and forms that are revealed to us by our eyes. That is what makes it a pramana. And the guru is not somebody one has to have faith in. The guru is somebody we invest our trust in, not because we are confident in what they say, because they're very smart and other things. We invest our shraddha in the guru because we know that the guru, who is a real guru and not a namesake guru, does not steer even one degree away from the Shastra. What the Shastra says, the guru reveals. The Guru makes the Shastras intelligible to us. It is kind of like, you know, you, you have uh, an example I can think of is if you have some raw uh, uh, grains or vegetables uh, growing uh, in, in the farm, you can't just consume them like that. You can't just consume grains. You need to cook them. And so the Guru is the one who cooks the Vedas for us in some sense so that we can consume it without falling sick. Otherwise, the Vedas will not be digestible to our minds. The Guru has to unfold it, and that process is what you call teaching. The process of cooking <laughs> is the teaching over here. And the digestion is something that ultimately we have to do as students. So that is why you know it, it is not uh, fanatical for us to say that yes, Shastra say, you know, you're Satchitananda Atma, and that alone is true. Because there cannot be anything else, it is a pramana. Any any questions here? <laughs> okay. So then, uh, if you'd like to continue. The importance of an open inquiring mind. The difference between a scientist and a believer is also worthy of notice. One may, one may adhere to a belief, but everyone must necessarily have a mind which is open to which is open to explore and know. That open inquiring mind, the mind of a scientist, is an entirely different mind from that of a believer. We can and must respect the beliefs of others, but we cannot have a discussion based on such beliefs. Both of us may be wrong. A discussion between two people, both of whom are committed to certain beliefs, is purely a dialogue between two missionaries. It is better to respect the other person's belief and have a simple human relationship. Discussions are useless. All you can do is ask, what is your belief? Some people are curious. If you are curious, you can ask. But I myself would not ask because the other person is acceptable to me, along with his or her beliefs. I need not know what they are. This is a healthy attitude to have towards a person. But any discussion, Jalpa, based on the beliefs, based on beliefs is useless. No one wins and no one loses. Each person always comes back with better arguments. Jalpa discussions, therefore, are useless. They have no value. There is another type of discussion called vit Vitanda. Mm -hmm wherein one person makes a statement with which the other person always disagrees. Why? Merely because the other person merely because the other person said it. Due to jealousy or some other reason, one person always tries to prove the other wrong. Such a discussion is also useless. A fourth type of discussion, one that concerns us here, is called Samvada. 
a discussion between a teacher and a, and a student. Guru Shishya Samvada. In the teacher-student relationship, the student has already accepted the other person as a teacher and therefore looks up to him or her. Although there is a dialogue between them, the attitude is entirely different. The discussion being based on the student's acceptance that I am a student and this person is my teacher. This attitude prevails until or unless the person thought to be a teacher proves to be otherwise. The moment you discover the person has nothing to teach, you can become friends. However, when you have to learn from someone, you look up to that person. If you do not understand what the teacher is saying, you give the benefit of the doubt to the teacher, even though he or she may sometimes appear to be contradictory, seeming to have said something previously that is not in harmony with what is being said now, as we will see in the Gita. Mm, very beautiful. Would anyone like to summarize what these four dialogues are, just in your own words? Nikita, if you if you'd like to go, since you just read, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, in your own words, you don't have to use the Sanskrit words. So the first one was the Vadaha, which is uh, just a conversation with uh, uh, Gopiji. Go ahead. Carry on, carry on, please carry on. I want okay. to do it. Okay. So the first one is uh, Vadaha, uh, which is a conversation uh, between equals. The second one uh, over here refers to Jalpa. So Jalpa is something that you will see between two people who are very staunch in their own respective systems. It's not a very uh, useful conversation. In fact, uh, I, I must admit there was a point when I was very prone to Jalpa. You know, when I, when especially like I think when you get exposed to something new and uh, fresh, you you are smitten by it. So when when my Vedanta exposure took place uh, a while back now. I think maybe for three to four years, I, I was definitely into Jalpa mode where, you know, I'd, I'd be on the internet, sitting behind the keyboard, like trying to debate people um, about these things. And to, to the extent it helped me, maybe it sharpened my own, I guess, understanding just because when you engage in this kind of discussion with people, but then after a point, it doesn't help you so much as a sadhaka. So, um, you know, you, you might as well join a debate team rather than use Vedanta for that. But yeah. You know that it's not a very helpful type of discussion. It's, it's called jalpa. The third one is completely worthless. Like it has absolutely no use, which is called vitanda. Vitanda is basically you having a dialogue with somebody only for the sake of disagreeing with that other person. It's not. It's not about the topic. It's about the person now. Okay. In jalpa, it's about the topic because you are not so much invested in your individual egos maybe there is some of that i don't i don't mean to say there isn't any of that but in jalpa it is more like uh, you could be very committed let's say to islam and somebody else may be very committed to christianity and they are unwilling to see what the other person has to say because they are so invested in their respective systems that they are only trying to proselytize the other person to come over to the other side and when both people are proselytizers, you're not going to have any luck convincing anyone to learn anything. There's no knowledge transfer that's going to take place. This is going to be a lot of heat and no light. Vitanda is much worse because here it's not the thing. You know, you're not invested in something, but here you're invested on, only in an inflated sense of self, right? A very egoistic approach, which is that, oh, I hate this person. I hate this person from the bottom of my heart. No matter what they say, it has to be wrong because I hate this person. And so if they take on position A, I will take on position B. If the person that I don't like takes on position B, then I will even drop my own position to just dismiss them and I'll take on position C. So th this kind of uh, discussion is actually a very personal personal thing. You know, the, the, <laughs> this happened at my workplace. It was ridiculous. So I've never been to a more, uh, uh, I guess, awkward embarrassing meeting in my life uh, like about a month or two ago uh, so so this manager of mine right he he's he's uh, 
invited us for a meeting and he's been in this company for some 15 16 years and so there's this other person from the revenue department and so then he is also into uh, you know invited to this meeting and they they are both trying to have some data element introduced into uh, you know our database so this guy is making a request that uh, in a very condescending way that uh, yeah you know I, I need to have this uh, data uh, you know let me know how soon you can get it done and he's not saying it very nicely there's a bit of rudeness in his approach now the other person is equally condescending you know he talks to my manager like he's a 3 year old child so he's explaining like you know st stuff that you would you know probably know day one of your job and this guy's been here for 15 years and like you know he just really was very condescending and then my manager lost it because at this point they were not talking to each other they were talking past each other because they had some long history and then uh, you know i was like yeah actually there are like four people in the in the room it's me it's you it's that guy and then the history that you have that's another seat right so the history is taken up a separate seat and the issue was essentially that my manager had actually trained this fellow about 15 years back and uh, he always felt that he had not been given uh, the due approval and the acknowledgement for the fact that whatever this guy knows he has taught him and so he starts throwing about these these things that oh you know i when 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 you join this company i taught you every single thing that you know i'm the one who trained you i'm the one who taught you i baby fed you and now you're talking to me as if you're my boss and this and that and i'm like guys just you know break it off let's let's knock it off and uh, uh, you know figure figure out a good solution to this problem so this is what happens this is vitanda that you don't want to listen to the other person just because you know you guys have some history that you need to dissolve so vitanda is very nasty very nasty okay and the fourth type of discussion is the one that we re we really want to focus on so let's uh, let me stop sharing the screen because i think we want to spend a decent amount of time talking about it so see one of the things that we talk about when we discuss a guru shishya relationship sambandha means relationship a cardinal error is to treat your guru as a friend the guru is not your friend you have to be friendly with the guru but never mistake your guru to be your friend i had done this long time back long time back means like seven, six seven years back uh, mistake mistake that i was looking at the guru as an equal right you you know i'm also studying with because i i'm also doing some vedanta you also doing some vedanta you know a bit more than me and you are teaching me but that you know there's something maybe i can also share with you and so i used to have this pressure to kind of like share stuff with with the teacher and then i realized that it, over, over here what's happening is that i am not see you know suppose you have a dam or if you have a uh, anything any any potential like whether it's electric electrical potential or hydro potential you know what water power whatever it may be it needs to be at a higher position for it to be able to discharge all of its potential energy to turn into kinetic energy right you need to have like a voltage difference in electricity or you need to have a height difference when it comes to hydro power and whatever the greater the difference between the guru and the shishya the greater will be the flow of knowledge and the less interrupted it will be as well it won't be impeded and and when we in our you know through our attitudes through our attitudes we create a sense of equality between the guru and the shishya and this shows in our vinayam because this is something i had to learn the hard way but in some sense i'm very grateful for it also because it you know it it turned out to be a good lesson for me because i became hyper alert and hyper attentive to these tiny 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 little errors of the mind when it comes to interacting with the guru and the attitude that we have towards the gurus so um for instance you know i'll, I'll just give a give a couple of examples that you know i, I went to the gurukulam i was i accompanied a friend to the gurukulam as well introducing them to some of the teachings and all so when the guru walks in it is very customary and not just customary but it, you know there's no way i cannot but stand up it's a very natural thing that you know when the guru enters the room you stand up you don't stay seated and then when the guru sits you only you know take a seat once the guru has been seated right you it's it's basic respect when the guru is you know about before they are about to start um, uh, delivering uh, pravachan you do namaskarams you you know whether the shashtang namaskara or whichever kind you do some namaskara to acknowledge the ashishyatvam and it may it may not even be your guru but even if it is an acharya who knows this teaching 
it is this basic paddhati paddhati doesn't have a good translation but i, I don't think mannerism is the right translation but you, you can say a set of practices and a set of attitudes that is you know encapsulated in this word called paddhati paddhati is your demeanor your attitude your conduct with with uh, you know the guru with uh, with the devata when you go to the mandir when you're offering worship when you're doing your japa when you're doing your sadhana there is a certain paddhati and initially as we were children that paddhati was inculcated in us through our family through our you know uh, domestic traditions through looking at the practices of great mahatmas and the itihasas so i want i want to talk a little bit more about this okay so for instance um, i'm i'm currently and i highly encourage this regardless of what age you are um uh, ramanand sagar's tv show it was uh, the 1986 or 1987 the ramayana tv show it is beautiful um my uh, five year old ambika is watching it right now um and we i think we are on like episode 28 or 29 and there are totally 78 episodes and the amount of um, character building that this tv series does is phenomenal it's out of the world if you have kids please show to kids if you don't have kids watch it yourself but you know expose yourself to this tv series once every couple of years because it's really really going to bring some something out in you like even even like you know when i watch it it may appear that i have years of experience with this teaching but i am moved to tears it's like uh, hardly an episode goes and i'm not like you know <laughs> there's some tears coming out it's just because it's so beautiful it's so touching it's so moving the respect that ram bhagwan has towards his parents towards his teachers towards his brothers towards his wife towards society as a king as a son as as you know whatever role that is that he's playing it's just phenomenal and of course you know the basis of this is our valmiki ramayana you know shri valmiki ji who you know um, gave us such a beautiful narrative to hold in our hearts so things like this can really teach us the respect that we have for the gurus um i i am a huge 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 fanatic of both the ramayana and mahabharata like you know it's phenomenal you can just keep on diving deeper and deeper and deeper into it and there's no end to it it's it's something so rich you know if you look at like the greek uh, um so called mythologies right the odyssey and uh, what is the other one the iliad and such okay okay because they have a lot of events but the characters are truly brought out in three dimension in our itihasas like you never see this kind of like character um um i guess character really in 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 any other place and it allows you to emulate your own personality after these these great mahatmas that's the best part um so ram bhagwan you know he as he wandered through the forest he had the good fortune of meeting so many rishis rishi bhadwaj rishi valmiki rishi agastya uh, gautama rishi this rishi that rishi rishi after rishi after rishi he just keeps meeting them and all of them give him some distinct teaching and the way he conducts himself in front of them like you know it is it's, it's it's very moving uh all of these rishis being trikal gnanis means they can see through all times past present future they know all that is going on they know that ram bhagwan is an avatar and yet in spite of being an avatar he is playing the role of you know purushottama the the uh, most refined the most sophisticated the most cultured the most adept skillful um uh, human being he is playing that role and so through that role he's also showing us what it means to relate to a guru as a student so here it is bhagwan who is born to show us what it actually means to be a student and the rishi is knowing that this is bhagwan allow him to do that because they recognize that this is rama's role so th- this is all you know in the context of paddhati understanding paddhati and understanding ourselves so going back to this whole thing you know so you know the friend had a company to the gurukulam Uh, you know she wouldn't stand up when the teachers walked in she would remain seated she wouldn't take bow down she wouldn't do anything sometimes you know your legs are stretched out towards like you know i it 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 hurts me when somebody is sitting in a mandir with their legs they kind of like this in front of the devtas or in front of the teacher it just it just doesn't sit in our heads you know or you know if if you touch a piece of paper with your foot or something you you immediately like you know do do this uh, we say jj karo gujarati <laughs> can you know because it's like you, you can't you can't stand to you know uh, 
you just can't stand it because you know it's the respect that we've invested into Saraswati as knowledge and into Lakshmi as wealth. It is not that one is respecting the piece of paper. It is what the paper represents. What it represents is knowledge. It's not that one is you know respecting the money, but it is what the money represents, which is Lakshmi, because all wealth belongs to Bhagwan. And who is empowering Bhagwan with wealth? It is Bhagavati, Lakshmi. And so Vishnu is the lord of all wealth. But the, the capacity of Vishnu to be this lord, to be Ishwara, comes from Ishwari, comes from Bhagavati, which is Lakshmi. So again, you know, this Pujya Samji says that in our culture, you know, we are always uh, going back and forth between uh, uh, the two, uh, two devis, Lakshmi and Saraswati. Either you seek knowledge or you seek wealth, but typically that's what we usually do in, in our lives. And it's a blessing to be able to do that. So um, the, this is what we mean by Paddhati. And in order to entertain a healthy guru shishya relationship, that Paddhati is very important. It is important to recognize my place before the Guru. And it is important to recognize the pedestal upon which one places the Guru, because the higher the pedestal, the greater will be the flow of knowledge. And not because the pedestal that we put the Guru on is somehow going to elevate the Guru, but rather we have created an attitudinal distance between myself and the Guru, which ensures that the flow of knowledge will be very strong. Okay, does that make sense? So I can't look upon my Guru as a buddy. I have to be friendly towards my Guru, but the Guru is not my friend. This is very important to recognize. Um, sometimes a lot of people in the West have this thing where they have an allergy to authority figures. For good reason, because you know if you look at the history of missionaries and such, there's been a lot of uh, pressure for you know upon people to conform to a certain way of conducting themselves, right? Like a lot of like do's and don'ts and commandments, like ten commandments kind of thing. Whereas in our tradition, we don't we don't have that kind of thing, but that allergic sense towards like a father figure or towards an authority figure also carries over. And so again, you know, it it, it hurts me to see people like referring to like you know Pujya Samji as Swami, or, or or sometimes they'll even skip the Swami and say Dayananda, Dayananda, something like that. Right? They they do those things. It doesn't sit with me. So oftentimes I've corrected people. I'm like. In front of me, you say Swami Dayananda. You don't just say Dayananda. He's not your buddy. He's not your friend that you'll call with your, you know, with, with by his first name. Paddhati. Okay, so Guru Shishya Sambadaha. This Paddhati, this distance that one creates between oneself and the Guru in terms of elevation is what turns a Vadaha, which is a dialogue that you and I have, into a Samvadaha, which is the dialogue between a Guru and a Shishya. Is that is that uh, meaningful and clear? Any questions? I have a couple of comments. Huh. See, in most of the cases, what we have is only a vada uh, in our usual uh, conversations. Jalpa and uh, Vitanda is in rare actually. We both are very rare situations where. Uh, uh, the ego comes comes forth, and uh, you know the ego talks than the than the usual knowledge. And uh, samvada, the, the samvada between the guru and shishya is basically uh, a, the teacher gives the knowledge to the student, and it's one way approach, and the students in a way assimilates that knowledge and if there is any question he will he will ask for the clarification and in uh, in in most of the cases we don't come across the jalpa and uh, vitanda and uh, when uh, when i was in uh, in a class with the puja swamiji in uh, rishikesh the way he conducted himself it gives uh, a lot of exposure which is which is beyond these teachings and words, you know. He, in spite of the problem that he has he has to undergo the dialysis every day, and he he comes to the class with the help of uh, two three persons, and the way he conducts himself uh, brings tears to our eyes every day almost. 
Even now, when I am speaking like this, I, I have tears in my eyes. Uh, how he conducted himself? It is it is beyond uh, words and expressions and feelings. The way I have seen, probably we we might not have seen the rishis and uh, munis, but uh, for me, he is more than a rishi because. Uh, in spite of so much of suffering, the way he he explains the each and every topic with such clarity and uh, uh, in between with jokes and stories and all these things, uh, bring home the point very clearly. Uh, it is one of the rarest opportunities that one, one will find to see that such kind of Mahatma and to see such kind of Mahatma is uh, a blessing in life. Thank you. Very well said. Very well said. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, Pujja Samaji was the quintessential teacher. And uh, I, from what I've seen, I met him a month prior to his Mahasamadhi. Uh, he had come to the US to say goodbye, really, to all of his students. Um, he was in a lot of pain. In fact, uh, you know, there was uh, so much difficulty that Swamiji had just moving about, because at that age, you know, as as you get older and as you are on a lot of medications, even your bones get very brittle. There's this calcification process that takes place, and the bones, uh, you know, don't have the same, I guess, uh, nimbleness to them. And so, you know, he was uh, on a stretcher for the most part, not even on a wheelchair, but mostly on a stretcher because they had to carry him uh, to, to look at everyone. And uh, you know, sometimes even if there's a slight movement, then you know parts of his, I guess, you know, his bones would start cracking uh, under the pain. And still, like you know, he made it to the U.S. And for the only reason that he knew that he had to give his students here closure, emotional, psychological closure, because they wouldn't see him again. And so he came here, and uh, you know, this was very, very sweet because again, you know, he was on painkillers. He was going through a lot of uh, the, he, his body was in a lot of pain. Let's put it that way. Unbelievable amount of pain. Lots of things were wrong with his organs, different organ failures and uh, different uh, problems that he was dealing with. But in spite of that, he had a very witty and sharp mind and a very um, you know admirable and enviable sense of humor also. So once uh, this, so this was my this was on my birthday uh, in uh, 2015, and this was the last time that we saw Pujo Samaji. August 2015 and September, he left his body. But uh, so, you know, I, I went to Pujja Samji's Kutia with, with my family. And, uh, you know, I wanted to do pranams to him. But uh, I, again, I'm, I'm sort of from West India, not, not from the southern part of India. And so, Dhoti, Veshti, all of these things are not very familiar to me. And I'm not, very, you know, uh, comfortable wearing them because I, I, you know, something may fall off. <laughs> so, anyway, you know, I, I bought a stitched Dhoti. And I, uh, you know, I just showed up uh, in Pujja Samji's kutia, and then, like, you know, obviously he was lying on on the bed, and then, uh, you know, I took his uh, blessings, and then he looks at me, and then he is pointing at my dhoti. He says, "Stitched, huh? <laughs> I said, "Yes, Samji, it's stitched." So, so you know, beautiful, wonderful sense of humor. Uh, another example I can give you, right? Uh, that uh, uh, when he was in Rishikesh. This was, I think, days before he left the body. Days, a couple of a week or so, maybe. And at that point, uh, uh, his uh, bhashya on Taitare Upanishad was released. The, edit, the edited form was released. And so Pujya Samaji would uh, ask somebody to hold the manuscript in front of him. And he wanted to audit every single word that was there. And he would, you know, like you know, make minor corrections and edits to that manuscript right till the very end, because what Pujya Samaji wanted to ensure was to um, communicate this teaching in a way that is uncompromised, no compromise, no blemish. And so, what Gopi Ji said is absolutely true, and we have the greatest, greatest respect for the rishis because they gave us the Vedas. They gave us the Vedas. It was revealed by Bhagwan to the Rishis, the Rishis gave it to us. But what makes Pujya Samji more special at a personal level is that Pujya Samji gave it to us directly. 
and so your kritagnata or your gratitude it stretches back all the way up the parampara but the greatest gratitude is to the one who's giving it to you here and now right just as your gratitude will be greater for your parents then it will be for your great 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 grandparents because you know that they are there and therefore you are here but that immediate connection is with your parents and same way the immediate connection is with the guru so in some sense the guru is pujniya the guru is pujya the guru is vandaniya worthy of worship and that's why you know i don't call swami dayananda ji swami dayananda i say pujya swami ji pujya because worship worthy no who else will you offer worship to if not the one who reveals your identity uh, between yourself and ishwar as as the same who else will you offer worship to? to because even that bhagwan which is distant comes so close to us because of this teaching because of the way it is unfolded so again like this attitude towards this guru whether it's towards pujya swami ji towards your immediate teacher is what turns the dialogue into a samvada because then and, and uh, the other thing is that uh, when a samvada is taking place there is no psychological pressure that we feel to want to respond again mistakes right mistakes i'm sharing with the team here so that nobody else makes it we often we all do this even now right in different situations we speak we listen to people to respond we don't listen to people to understand does that make sense has this ever happened to you where somebody is saying something but before they finish a sentence you already have a response ready of course it's happened and that only means that that listening has not taken place what we were doing is we were we were reacting to what was said we were not responding to what was said and that listening is what enables one to be a good shishya so now the samvada is obviously you know important the dialogue between arjuna and uh, krishna bhagwan is a samvada chapter 1 it is a vada okay chapter 1 is hey krishna take my chariot to the middle of the battlefield come i want to see all of my enemies that's what he says he says oh krishna come here come let's let's go and let's uh, let's uh, stand in the middle of kurukshetra i want to get a good look at all of these rascals that i'm fighting basically because he's very angry avesh mein he is a sort of krodha nagjuna and that's not wrong for 13 years he was in this vanvas okay and the last year he was in this uh, incognito mode i'm not talking about your browser i'm talking about incognito mode uh, he, you know the story is that um, for they had lost this bet with the kauravas through cheating the kauravas cheated and then they were deprived of their birthright of uh, of um, uh, indraprastha as and uh, and uh, kurukshetra and uh, they were made to leave the kingdom without anything and for 12 years they had to be in the forest but in the last one year they had to be incognito which means that if they were discovered by the spies that duryodhana and others would send then they would have to uh, stay back in the forest an additional 12 or 13 years or something like that okay so if somebody does this to me i'm going to be i'm going to be very explosive like a volcano so arjuna was rightfully angry he he disliked the, what these people did and he really really wanted to battle them so that's why he says ki you know i want to take a good look at these 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 people show me show me what they where they are how they are positioned why because kshatriya no what does he want to look at them for he wants to understand their army formation he wants to understand how they are positioned how they are uh, anyway we'll see all of this in chapter 1 so i don't want to give it away it's not there's no spoilers here but anyway that's how he behaves with uh, krishna in chapter 1 that oh you know you are my you my buddy krishna come let's 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 see these guys chapter 2 with that statement uh, 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 shishyas teham shadi mam twam prapannam he says this to krishna ultimately that i am your shishya please save me please deliver me please give me this teaching please give me this what i seek freedom okay so chapter 2 he becomes a shishya then everything in chapter 2 onwards is a vada and samvada sorry interestingly adi shankaracharya ji he wrote uh, multiple multiple bhashyas including on the bhagavad gita gita bhasha he wrote vishnu sahasram bhasha upanishad bhasha brahma sutra bhasha 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 that's why we call him bhashakara whatever adi shankaracharya ji is written is authoritative it is authority 
it is as good to us as the vedas okay the, the pramana pramana basically the commentary that adi shankar acharya ji writes on the bhagavad gita begins from chapter 2 verse 11 why because that is when the samvada begins krishna bhagwan starts teaching the gita only from uh, chapter 2 verse 11 until then it, they are talking as friends then he is talking as a teacher and adi shankar acharya doesn't care for that the part he says like, it doesn't matter you know it's okay i want to get to the real real deal so we will see all of that any questions so far before we proceed okay let us uh, proceed one minute we'll read one uh, small section and then uh, uh we can close off after that uh if you'd like to continue dialogue between teacher and student in a guru shishya samvada the subject matter can be anything here in the gita the subject matter is brahma vidya and yoga shastra in one word vedanta The guru is Bhagwan Krishna, referred to as Vasudeva's son. The student is Arjuna, called Partha, here because he is Pritha's son. He is also called Kauntia. Kauntia. Kauntia, the son of Kunti. Arjuna has a number of other names. <laughs> Da, Dhananjaya, Dhananjaya, Savya Sachi, Savya Sachi, and Guda Kesha. Guda Kesh. Oh, oh, sorry, this is bad. I was gonna say I know Guda Guda Kesh from cricket. Guda Kesha, yes. and so on. But Arjuna is his popular name. Between Arjuna, the student, and Lord Krishna, the teacher, the The teacher, there is a discussion, and Gita is the body of knowledge being taught. Therefore, the Gita is called a samvada. Okay, one second. I'm just seeing if. Uh... Okay. So okay, let's let's pause here because I think we've covered quite a bit, and uh, uh, let me also turn the recording off. And I just want to connect with you all, uh, just to get a sense of. Um, um you know how how we wish to proceed like in the future and 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 the reason i ask is uh, currently we are on page 44 and uh, i know we've covered a lot of content i think this will be like the 23rd satsanga uh, on on the gita and we've been averaging like two pages per per session which is essentially two pages per week and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because you know let's just say that uh, what matters is not how much we go through as much as how much has gone through us the quality and the content and the depth matters a lot more than just this whole page turning business okay so it's not necessarily a bad thing but uh, where i want to check in with you all and maybe i'll keep the recording on because i think uh, listeners on on youtube uh, may also get some context uh, as to where we are headed and one is welcome to tune out of the discussion uh, listeners also on on youtube but do you all think it's a good idea to study x number of pages each week and i i know some of you all are part of the other other satsanga group as well um where we are covering other materials such as tattva bodh and other things so this is not to put any pressure because you know just just maintain the same fixed schedules that you have each week but for the ones who are not studying the tobodha and other texts that we have assigned in the small satsanga group would you like to do 10 to 15 pages each week independently and then show up to satsanga uh with questions or do you prefer that we read this together i can see the benefit of both and let me share my perspective first and then i can open it up for comments that you know perspectives that others might have as well so one of the benefits i think of reading together however slow we may be because at this pace i'm not exaggerating but we'll 
most of us will be dead before the Gita is over. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We'll attain the same knowledge, qualitatively speaking. So uh, I know from what Puja Samji has said in one of his lectures recently also, he doesn't always follow a certain script. He, and I've mentioned this, I think, in the last uh, last satsang also, or perhaps the previous one, that what matters to Puja Samji is you know, what is taught, does it give clarity into knowledge of the self? Does it give clarity into the teaching of Vedanta? If it does, then it's OK if one doesn't cover a certain agenda or complete a certain text in a fixed amount of time. One can always continue with, 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 with it independently. The benefit of reading together is sometimes one may have questions that they don't think that they have or they don't know that they have. And the elaboration as part of this uh, you know, process may answer those questions that people have silently swallowed. Okay, So that is one advantage. And uh, the other advantage is that uh, we, if we read independently, and I say this without patronizing, but it took me a decade to actually understand, more than a decade, I think, to understand what it means to read something as a pramana and to be able to see it in depth. And it's not always a very easy thing, especially when one has started you know, with, with a couple of years or even a couple of months of experience with, with the teachings. So there's a lot of depth that one can dive into as one is studying these things together. But it may be a, a relatively a bit more superficial if one is just reading it you know, page after page after page independently. So that is, again, one of the disadvantages of reading independently. The advantage, however, is that if we are able to assign pages for reading each week, at least there will be some guarantee that before um, you know, we pop off, we'll complete the text. So what does everyone think? There's pros and cons to both. I, I can go around and I can just ask people, point at people like Gopiji, thoughts? Both are equally good, I think. Because, you know, we require the book to to not only study here, but also study individually. And also we require some amount of teaching because one can't understand the text oneself because there will be so many doubts. So satsangs like this will clarify those doubts. So both are equally good. So that's a that's a good feedback. So based on that, if I update my approach as follows, what does everybody else think about this? Suppose we say let's conservatively take uh, five to seven, or maybe seven to ten pages, sustainable reading per week. We read it together. I read it as well. If people have questions, we'll address those questions. But if I come across something salient, I can go into it in depth as we are during the session too. Is that a good idea? Or would you prefer like reading together as like Rikita was doing right now, which I think yeah, is also a good thing? That is a good idea. Good idea? Yeah. Can, can I just have a show of hands to vote for that approach? One, two, three. Do you mean the one which we are doing right now, where we are reading together, but a little faster? Uh, I'm, I was speaking more of uh, the approach where we read privately. Anna? Okay. Over the course of the week, I read it as well, along with everyone. And then if there are any uh, uh, salient points, I highlight them during satsanga. But we dedicate the satsanga primarily for questions and answers. Or or we uh, the second option is we continue currently also. And I don't see any problem with this either. I think both are fine. So the we, Option A is the first one. Option B is the second one. Uh, Can I see please? option A's? Can you raise your hands for option A? And first, whoever. Option A. Okay, so one. And option B is what we are currently doing. Option B. Is is Vasu's hand up? Okay, I see your hand up. I, it was outside of the frame. So wait, one, two. Say so wait. I, I didn't count everyone. One, two. Nikita three, Vasu four, Manthan, Aparnaji, 
Malaji, Malaji, what was yours? Mine option was for option A. Option A. Option A. Okay. And Manthan option A. Oh my goodness, this is a this is a tie. This is a tie. Okay, so I have a suggestion. What if uh, we well based on our progress of everything? I do feel like we would uh, usually do ten pages in a satsang session, right? We don't. So, what if we aim for five pages but go through it on the day of the satsang? So, like, we, like what we did with Tatwa Boda, we kind of pitch the pages, like, let's do page 60 to 65 for upcoming week. You know what I'm scared of in that approach? I like that. I like that approach, personally. I'm no, but be very we honest. read... We we not, take not, the time not, to read for ourselves. Not everyone's gonna read. Well, it gives uh, <laughs> um, it, it kind of gives you well, example me a chance to read the next five pages, yeah. think about it, come up with the questions, but at the same time, on the day we go through the five pages because I feel like in in that moment, like what we do every single satsang since we've started Gita you also have things that you would raise on your end if we do it the other way around i feel like nobody would sorry i don't mean anything to anybody but i feel like it's true we, nobody would raise a question <laughs> so I, I i like the idea so what i'm going to do is i'm going to pop, i'm going to shut the recording let's take another five minutes after that and let's uh, finalize one approach so i Thanks for bearing with me. Let me just pause recording with the Shanti Mantra. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashashyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om